culture. Today's subject is the topic of culture, which is culture is the most important idea that anthropology has given to the world. I don't think there's anything that you could say that is a more important or more well-known idea that basically comes out of anthropology than culture. And so it's, it's a tremendously important idea. It's probably the key idea of anthropology. And for most anthropology textbooks, we put it right, well, we, we give it to you at the beginning, and then we put it right in the middle of the textbook, right between archeo right after the archeology span section. Um, it remains today an incredibly important idea, but usually not for the reasons that we think about it as being important. That is to say, we all know the term culture now. We all use it, we've all heard of it. It would be difficult to imagine uh, anyone almost around the world not knowing this term. There are like six-year-old kids who if you talk about how they eat or something, they'll say, don't, that's my culture. Everybody knows this term and it's tremendously important, but perhaps not for why we think it's important. In Levin and Schultz, and in many anthropology textbooks, we often try to make the term and the idea, I believe, more complicated than it needs to be made, because it's a fairly simple idea. And so people are like, well, what, what's the big deal with that idea? And so we give us a lot of, of deep thoughts and ideas and concepts around it, and make it more difficult to understand than it is. The reason it is important, though, is where it fits into our historical trajectory in terms of how the idea was introduced into the world and what it was introduced against. And so in this chapter, I mean, in this, in this, uh, in this class, we're going to be looking at culture, but not exactly in the way, well, in the way that Lavin and Schultz want us to, but in some ways we have to first understand, in order to understand culture's importance, we have to first understand what it was that anthropologists were fighting against. And so in many ways, culture is anthropology's attempt to fight against something that they themselves had adopted for a while, which is the idea of unilineal evolutionism, that one society, as we talked about at the very beginning of this archeology span unit, that man the hunter inevitably evolve, evolves into man the herder, man the farmer, and into civilization. And that everyone is on a predetermined lockstep ascent from savagery or barbarism into civilization. We've tried in the archaeology unit to talk about how that's not historically true, but it's also uh, simply a, a misrepresentation of what is going on uh, archaeologically and historically. But it is the idea of culture that is how anthropology sort of positions itself against an earlier idea or an earlier explanation which is in some ways still with us today, but, but not in the same way as it was a uh, hundred or 150 years ago, which is to say that anthropology originally deployed the idea of culture or took this idea of culture because they were fighting against ideas that our human behavior was determined by our race or our biology. And that that is what accounted for human capacities, human potential, and for how humans talked and how they uh, did things differently. So the importance of culture is not necessarily so much trying to understand exactly what it is, as much as it is trying to understand what it is 
not or what it is speaking against. In order to do that, we are going to have to go deep into some archaeology and history that Lavender and Schultz really don't give us enough of. And so we're going to be going into some stuff that occurs between the end of the last chapter and the beginning of this chapter. And I'm also going to be drawing upon uh, one of the smartest people I knew in graduate school. I think I've mentioned him from time to time. Uh, the Haitian anthropologist uh, has passed on now, but uh, extremely uh, insightful person who talked about, who wrote two essays that I'm drawing on here for my own idea of culture and how it is important to anthropology and to the world. Trouillot appears, Michel Rolf Trouillot appears later in Levin and Schultz in this chapter. Uh, his Perhaps his most famous essay is called Anthropology and the Savage Slot. I'm also drawing on an, another essay that he worked on, which is called Adieu Culture, or goodbye culture, a new duty arises. So uh, I'm trying to work in some stuff from the sort of historical record together with, with the insights of, of Trio, who, who sort of brilliantly framed the place of anthropology and culture in relationship to what was going on in world history. So, the reason we're doing this is if you remember back to the end of chapter seven, we end with the Inca Empire. And there's a, I found the picture that they use in the textbook of the quipu, the Inca knotted string, which they use for record keeping. We have this extremely sophisticated, large political empire in the Andes, which has incredible technological feats. So that's where we end chapter seven and we end our archaeology unit. And then the next thing you know, there's a guy on a snowmobile with a dog somewhere hunting up in the Arctic. And the thing is, is we need to know kind of what happened between the Inca Empire and this Kipu and the guy on the snowmobile. We need to know what happened between basically what we might call the year 1500 and around 1900 when the idea of culture was being introduced, the idea of anthropology in general was coming out. So up until this point, up until now in our reading, we've been doing a relatively chronological thing. We've been going from human evolution and bipedalism and homo sapiens all over the place. And then we went through hunting and gathering, domestication, the rise of the ancient civilizations and the ancient states. But at this point, at around 1500, at around the time when the Inca empire is flourishing, but about to be conquered, the chronology sort of disappears. And this happens in almost every anthropology, in fact, every anthropology textbook that I've used. And it's always between chapter seven and chapter eight. It's always between the archeology span and the cultural part. And I'm not sure why the chronology disappears there. I'm not sure why. I think that maybe we're just saying, ah, right, that's what you learn in your world history classes, or that's what you learn in history classes. We do anthropology, which is either archaeology, ancient stuff, or cultural stuff, which is the now, snowmobiles. We don't do from 1500 to 1900. Now, that may be true, and maybe that's why we leave it to history to do this, but I'm going to make a bet here that a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about from 1500 to 1900, you never learned in a history class. You can yell out if I'm wrong. I'll give you some opportunities to yell, just like me. So 
What I think we need, or I've been telling Levin and Schultz they need this chapter for a long time and they still haven't put it in. This is their fifth edition. I've been telling them to put it in for many chap for many editions and they still haven't written it yet. It's the chapter that I want them to write between chapter seven and chapter eight. So I've had to do it myself, which is chapter seven and a half, which is what happened between the ancient civilization, the archeology span and when anthropology comes out. So this is my world history in about 10 minutes. Well, we'll go into the history part soon, but maybe 15 minutes of world history, which is basically in all of the archeological stuff, a lot of stuff was happening all over the world. There were people trading with each other and interacting. There were empires that came and went. Cities came and fell. People developed their hunting techniques and some people remained and I don't wanna say they were stagnant, but they kept being hunters and gatherers different kinds of ecosystems developed and niche construction all over the world. And so I actually gave it this to you, or I, I represented this in the last class. If you remember, I did this whole thing with the, you know, the gathering and hunting and the bands and the chieftains and the tribes and the trans egalitarian societies come in and then an empire comes up, another empire comes up, it fades away an empire empire goes away and another empire goes away and that's a lot of things happen and if you surveyed sort of where things got uh how to say exciting where powerful urban areas developed there's an interesting kind of thing that happens if you did uh, a survey of this every 500 years and so later on, it's a text box that again appears later on in Lavin and Schultz where they, uh, they look at a book called Questioning Collapse. It's also, it's actually written as a critique again of the collapse narrative of Jared Diamond that we looked at in the last class. And what this book did is these archeologists said, well, what if we surveyed the most powerful and largest cities in the world at different time intervals. And then, so they said, if we went back 1500 years, 500 AD or 500 common era, we should probably say, the most powerful and largest cities in the world were in what is now Mexico, what is now Italy, and what is now China. If we fast forward 500 years from there, or we go back a thousand years from here, we'd find the most dynamic places to be in what is now Peru. If you remember, we were talking about the rise of some Andean civilizations there, what is now Iraq, and what is now Central Asia. And then they say, and if we rewound 500 years ago to about 1500, the things, the places where it was happening, and where urban life was the most sophisticated and developed, we're again in what is now China, what is now India, and what is now Turkey. So what's interesting here is one is that, you know, different places kind of come and go and develop. And there's not necessarily a, 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 a this happens in different parts of the world. So that's one thing that's interesting. But it is also interesting that all during this time, in the years of the last 2000 years or so, those Northern parts of Europe, like, you know, England and maybe Northern France and what, well, you know, those Scandinavian countries were in some ways pretty peripheral to the rest of the world. They didn't have these dynamic urban cities. It might be an exaggeration to say that they were seen as a barbaric backwater place, a place where you didn't want to go. But certainly when Caesar was marching armies up there from Rome, 
they thought that the people that lived up there were clearly not in the same civilized category as themselves. So something happens in the last 500 years, which gives the advantage to the European countries, especially in the North, and is the reason why we're doing this whole thing in English right now, right? That we're not doing it in, uh, in Urdu, uh, you know, we're not using the language, of, we're not using Quechua to teach this class. Something happened, and so in, in the, for the most part, uh, the global languages at least have, have been languages like Spanish and English, and now uh, we're starting to, uh, to adjust ourselves to a, a, a new reality, but for a, a long time, these were the, the, the big languages. So, again, if we go back to about 500 years ago, if you remember, our archaeologists tell us that people in Europe were trying to get to and get the stuff from these dynamic cities, which were in Turkey and India and China at the time. And a lot of these places were part of uh, the expansion of what was the Islamic empire. And so what had happened is after the death of Muhammad, there was a, a large expansion, rapid expansion of a, a very big uh, uh, Islamic empire. And um, this was in some ways seen at the time as the most developed and the most civilized uh, place you could be. They had preserved the ancient Greek texts. They had the best mathematicians, as we know from Arabic numerals, which are our own numeric system, which we adopted uh, in part because Roman numerals are really not good for multiplying and dividing. So mathematics, uh, and also uh, a lot of our agricultural techniques, um, they uh, introduced or they, they brought from, uh, from basically from India into the into the West, the cultivation of what uh, they called asuka, which is uh, an Arabic word for what we know then got adopted in Spain as azúcar and eventually translated uh, into English as sugar. And so a lot of the sugars and spices and, and other things that the Europeans really wanted were uh, basically controlled by uh, this far-reaching empire. And even more interesting is that this empire controlled parts of Europe, including what we know now as Spain and Portugal, or the Iberian Peninsula, and into southern France. And so this was kind of uh, one of the things that was happening is when uh, different European powers were trying to reach Asia, they were finding their way blocked and the, the Silk Road blocked by some of these uh, political developments. So, this is the Iberian Peninsula in 1491. It's what we call the place which is now the countries of Portugal and Spain. And so I've chosen the year 1491 because as we all know, what happens in 1492? Christopher Columbus. Christopher Columbus. Well, sort of. Christopher Columbus officially is wandering over and chancing upon uh, some islands in the Caribbean in 1492. But if you actually lived in the Iberian Peninsula in 1492, that would have not have been the most important thing that was happening for you. Um, in part because that was in October and he didn't get back and he didn't really know where he was anyway. That's why he called people uh, names that didn't belong to them at all. In 1492 was also, or perhaps at least more importantly for people who lived on this peninsula, the fall of the kingdom of Granada. Uh, 
You can see it down there. It was the last Muslim caliphate that ruled over this part of, of what is now Spain. And so the, Portuguese, the people who would later call themselves Portuguese and Spanish at the time, they more identified with their kingdoms of Castile and Aragon, um, were, had banded together to kind of push back the Islamic empire and reestablish uh, Christian rule over this area of Spain. And so in 1492 was the expulsion of the Muslims from Europe. And it also marked the expulsion of the Jews from uh, the Iberian Peninsula and the start of the Spanish Inquisition, which basically said, you must become Christian or you must leave. And so what happens is, is that these two tiny countries, they weren't even countries yet, uh, based upon their oceanic exploration and their trade uh, routes, and in some ways their, uh, their, their religious fervor, you might say, to kind of, uh, to sort of spread uh, Catholicism, end up creating these enormous empires. And so we ended with the Inca empire, which at the time was a much bigger place than either Spain or Portugal. It had an enormous road network. It was more linguistically unified uh, under the, the Quechua system. It was, you know, it was an impressive civilization, but it ends up falling to uh, Spanish explorers. And of course uh, the Portuguese in various parts of Africa uh, in what is now Brazil, in India, in the Philippines uh, and in Asia, they set up these, uh, they set up transoceanic empires. And they were also beginning as we talked about in the last class, uh, as these European explorers were going out, they were encountering a, a much wider diversity of political and economic systems than they had known before. So people were coming into contact with each other. It's not that they didn't know that there were people who were different. People had always been exploring and, and trading with each other, but these two worlds, uh, the, what we call the new world and the old world or the Eurasia and the Americas were coming back into contact after centuries of separation. And so in the last class, I think I mentioned that, uh, or, or Levin and Schultz talk about people who have speculated the Anthropocene, that era of human, uh, 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 in which human activity becomes extremely important in the earth, some people have said, well, let's go back to agriculture and the state or about 10,000 years ago. Other people have said, nah, it's up like 1950 and the atomic revolution. Other people have said, no, it's the, uh, it's, it's the industrial revolution. That's when it really all starts. Some people have suggested that it actually happened when the Americas and, uh, and Eurasia come together. And the reason they've suggested that is because we have these trans-species contact between things like corn and potatoes and tobacco, as we've talked about going into the uh, old world while, uh, while the new world gets horses and cows and, and wheat. Uh, and so you have this massive transoceanic shift of crops and also of people. And so you have uh, in the Americas, the decimation of the indigenous population. Uh, and as we'll talk about it, a, the, uh, the massive uh, influx of people from Eurasia and, and, and from Africa. Um, and so uh, the geologists say that in 1610, there is actually a register uh, in, the, in the geological record that this was kind of because of the, uh, the decimation of so many people, especially the farmers in the, in the Americas, uh, the levels of CO2 
actually reached the lowest point in recorded history. And so this is like the coolest point also. And from this time forward, you can see the drop off of CO2 levels. And then, but from here on, it's been basically kind of warming up ever since. So again, I put a question mark there. You know, I mean, it, there's debate about where exactly we want to mark off this period or even if we should. But what I'm trying to get at is how enormous this shift is in human history when these, uh, these continents again come back together and, and the effect that this had on world history. So a couple things happened. Uh, well, a lot of things happened, but I wanna highlight a couple things that happened in the Americas. The Spaniards often were looking for gold and other things, often land and, and people to labor for them, uh, you know, but famously some of the first came for gold. It wasn't later, there wasn't a ton of gold in the Americas, although they did take a lot from the Incas and others. Um, a little later, and this is a book jacket uh, quote uh, from a book called Potosi, the silver city that changed the world. And so what happened in Potosi is that they had a huge supply that had to be mined of silver. And it is silver, basically this, this one, well, it's a pretty big mountain, but it's a pretty small place, uh, gets put into all of these trade routes in Asia, those places that the Europeans were trying to get to. And so the silver really injects a, a whole new dynamic into the world economy. And as our book jacket by Chris Lane says here, this place becomes a legendary city. Everybody knows about it. If you were in Istanbul in Turkey or in Beijing in China, everybody's heard of Potosi. So like I said, where is Potosi? the silver city that changed the world. Hmm. Yeah, I took that part out. It was the, and the Andes. It was actually an Andean prospector. It is in what is now Highland Bolivia. So there's a city that changed the world, provided half the world's silver, was famous all over the world, uh, and We've never heard of it, right? We don't even know it's there. There's a painting of Potosi in 1758. You can see the sort of regular grid design at a time when, I mean, this is before uh, the cities in, in the, there weren't even cities in the United States to speak of. We had people from all over the world coming here. There's that mountain of silver in the background. Um, people from all over the world coming here. Um, and being brought here to labor, to seek the wealth of that place. It was actually a, a city that at its time was larger than London. It was one of the largest cities of the world. It's been called the first city of capitalism. And a lot of people believe that the dollar sign, our dollar sign, is actually a derivation of the Potosi Mint sign that marked the this, this Spanish pesos that were minted from Potosi. So hugely influential in revitalizing or vitalizing the trade routes and the silver from Potosi would, would play an enormous role in transforming the world economy. Also here, or I mean a little bit later I should say, uh, the partially the Spaniards and partially the Portuguese, but also increasingly with the participation of Northern Europe, so from uh, Britain and France and the Dutch, began to enslave a tremendous number of Africans, about 10 million in total, 10, 12 million in total, and bring them mostly into the Americas. 
and mostly to work on plantations. Now this map shows us kind of the, it, it has a, a, it's scaled so that you can see where people were brought to in what kinds of numbers. And one of the things you'll notice here is that North America was kind of a small player in how many uh, enslaved Africans were brought. And in fact, this kind of has to do, if I talk about plantations and slavery, what do we usually think about in the United States? What image comes to mind? What are they growing? Huh? Yeah, we think about the South and what, what's our association? What crop? Cotton. And, you know, that was important. It was, you know, it was a thing. It was a deal. And it was important in the United States. It's certainly important for U.S. history. But the vast majority, the vast majority of enslaved Africans were brought to the Caribbean, Jamaica, San Domingue, Cuba, and to Brazil in order to plant and harvest and cut sugarcane. That was the main driver of this, of, of this trade. Um, like I said, it's not that it's not that the you're, that nothing happened in the in what was the in North America, but it was actually a pretty small part probably less than 5% of the overall trade, which for the most part was uh, geared toward sugar plantations and the production of sugar. This is a picture of uh, what, this is not a plantation, this is cutting the sugar cane, which is an enormously uh, difficult task. And, and it was, very backbreaking and one of the things that 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 killed people the the most um, was actually cutting the sugar cane uh, so this is uh, from the island of San Domingue and this was a French colony it produced an enormous quantity it was one of the richest colonies in in the Americas in the Caribbean it produced an enormous quantity of sugar but also of coffee indigo cotton, as they say here, it's at one time at its heyday, it was producing as much as Brazil and Jamaica combined, a very, a very actually small island. Anybody ever been to San Domingue? Anybody know what San Domingue is today? This extremely rich and profitable French colony in the Caribbean? Now it's called Haiti. It's on the other side of the Dominican Republic. That island was called San Domingue. Haiti, or San Domingue, was the site of the first and only successful slave revolution, which established an independent country and freed themselves from this system. Again, we've never heard about it. If we hear about Haiti, we think about people in poverty and an earthquake and something. This was an enormously profitable colony for the French. And it was also one of the only times in history, and it blew people's minds, that, that, that the people who were enslaved were able to form their own government uh, and, and establish independence from France. And if you click on that link I, I copied there, it's an article about how important the Haitian Revolution was for something we probably have heard about, which is the Louisiana Purchase. That you've heard about in school, right? Jefferson and Napoleon. The only reason the Louisiana Purchase could be made was because Napoleon lost, basically lost Haiti, was unable to keep what was a profitable part of the French colonies. And so he basically said, screw it, I'm gonna sell this to the, you know, I'll sell it to the Americans. 
because I got wars to fight here in Europe. And so he sold it on the cheap. But if it hadn't been for the Haitian Revolution, there would have been a very different uh, a different relationship between that territory that the French held uh, from New Orleans up a pretty large, large band of territory there that, that Jefferson was able to make. Again, I'm doubting that we hear about the Haitian Revolution when we're reading about the Louisiana Purchase. You can yell at me if I'm wrong. So, summarize. We've now reached up until about the 1860s, about the time that Darwin is coming out with his uh, natural selection ideas, the ideas of evolution are coming out. Remember, there's no anthropology yet. I mean, some people are thinking about it, but not, not really, there's, there's no anthropologist, there's no academic anthropologist to speak of. So up through this time, what has happened? We've had the Spanish and the Portuguese move people around, move all kinds of people into different places, uh, establish new uh, crops and species all over the world. And then this silver from Potosi revitalizing the world economy. We've had sugar plantations in the Caribbean and in Brazil take what was once this exotic thing that was extremely expensive that only the, the elites, the, the rulers could have, azúcar, and again, note the Arabic origins of that word, into the mass-produced commodity that it became, where it became a part of, of everyday life for the working classes. And so the, what we call the Europe, the Industrial Revolution, was actually built on these earlier episodes of, of being able to extract uh, silver and other resources from the Americas uh, and the, the labor that, was, that, that came from, uh, from slavery and from the, the being able to provide people with cheap calories in the form of sugar, also coffee uh, and tea, which were stimulants for soft drugs, you might say, of this whole uh, industrial revolution. Now, in the process of industrialization, we tend to have forgotten about these earlier episodes. We forgot about where it came from. And that's why we've never heard where Potosi is. We don't know about Haiti. We don't know the importance of these areas. And so in this time period, the world became arranged or the world was arranged as a kind of hierarchy of races and social groups where the Europeans, especially the top of the Europeans were thought that they were or were basically in charge of the system. And then you had other people uh, arranged in terms of their contribution to the system. And then they have the great idea to explain what was going on in the world by that very racial arrangement. And so it's kind of this wonderful, uh, by wonderful, I'm not saying it's nice. It's a kind of circular argument in which you've set up a system of inequality based on race and social standing, but then you use race in order to say, well, that's the reason why things are the way they are, because we're obviously the ones who are meant to be superior. That's the way it is. And so by the time any anthropology is even starting to think about things, we're sort of already stuck in a very hierarchically organized world in which people believe that they're racial qualities are also responsible for uh, how people are hierarchized or how they are organized in the world. And so if we go back to this notion that we saw at the beginning of this unit about biological race, and we talked about how biologically uh, 
we can talk about skin color and other features as being gradually varying over geography and clinal during this colonial period, because of the population movements and putting together people who were, had been in some ways geographically separated, we came up with this idea that there are three or four or five different races of the world. And we got those ideas from the very places that people came from. And as we mentioned, other people were kind of left out of the hierarchy here. Um, there were, I guess I should mention, because of, uh, in some ways, what we're seeing now in terms of, you might be wondering, well, what, what's the deal with the anti-Asian racism that we're seeing? In some ways, the Asians too, we're grouped into this category of being brought to the Americas in different ways in order to labor, but not to be allowed to be citizens. So it's fine if the Chinese are working on the railroad, but the moment they're done with the railroad, you want to send them back to China. And so a lot of people were brought in in order to do various jobs, but people were very reluctant. <sighs> Uh, very reluctant. That would be an understatement. People refused to grant citizenship if they could help it to the people that they wanted just to work for a while and go back to wherever they were from. And so we have these populations that were brought in by hook or by crook, by force into the Americas in order to do certain things, but not in order to, uh, to, to be a part of uh, this system, which was basically uh, run by the, by, by the European-American elites. Now, where are we? We're fine. So, all this stuff has happened between the end of chapter seven, that the Inca Empire, and the time that anthropology starts thinking about and going and thinking about other people and becoming an academic discipline. Anthropology doesn't get started until, you know, about 120 years ago, around 1900. I mean, some people probably in the 1880s and some people maybe would say the 1920s, but around that time, fairly recently and after all this other stuff has happened. And so anthropology comes out in, a, in, in, a, in various places, but it basically comes out in several, uh, in several Northern European places. So it isn't around for the Spanish and the Portuguese empires. Those have kind of come and gone, not even around for the, the Dutch, but it comes out more later among uh, British anthropologists and French anthropologists who would go and study the people in the British Empire in Africa, for example, or the French Empire, again, in Africa and Asia and different places. And it also emerges in the United States where people would, for the most part, began studying uh, indigenous peoples or Native American groups. And then later on, as the United States acquired a great deal more power than it had before, uh, US anthropologists would come to, to also be dominant in, in the world. And so, I mean, there's a lot of different, I, I'm uh, abbreviating the history of anthropology and I didn't come here for a history of anthropology class, but I'm just trying to say, here's where anthropology emerges, which as you can tell is also in the places that are kind of at the top of the, um, of the empire system at the time. And so what Trio has argued is that when he says the savage slot, what he means is that here you have this academic discipline, which is assigned to study everybody outside of the main centers of power. And so the anthropologists were sent out into different places all of which were kind of grouped into this idea of not being civilized or being the savages. And so if you have disciplines like sociology and economics, political science, 
those disciplines, for the most part, studied themselves. If you were a French sociologist, you studied in France. If you were a British economist, you studied in the UK. And same thing in, in other places. And it's only really, in some ways, it's anthropology for the most part that is sent out to study all these other people. And the central question for, again, for the, in this hierarchy that was created for the United Statesians and the Europeans at the time is what, why are these people like that? Why are they? So what, what, what makes them, what makes them weird? What makes them not like us? And as we talked about, the most common explanation at the time was that, you know, well, we'll measure their heads and we'll measure their skin and we'll measure their tongues. And, and that's going to tell us what kinds of languages they can talk. Or, we'll we're, or maybe they're the way they are because certain people grow bananas and people that grow bananas have a certain social structure. And these things were kind of uh, sometimes linked together. So the idea is, well, if you grew up in the tropics, then there's no seasons. And if you have all the bananas that you want and you're in the tropics, then you're not going to develop the same kinds of ideas. And so everything was arranged as this kind of hierarchy. As we've talked about, it was a hierarchy that was arranged because of an economic need and because of an economic and political inequality. But then that very inequality was used to explain why people were the way they were and why some people were, uh, were called developed and some people were called primitive. And again, this completely overlooked the fact that the very development that, the, that some people had was based on their exploitation of, of the resources of others who were then left and forgotten uh, when, when the, the resources dried up. So anthropology comes in and as it is rooted in European and North American academia is hardly immune from these ideas. And as we saw, some of the first anthropologists were the ones who kind of came up with the idea of unilineal evolutionism or participated in this very hierarchy. But eventually, uh, with people like Boaz and others, anthropology said those ideas were wrong. That that was not, that race and, and environmental determinism was not the explanation for human difference. That the differences that we perceive in our thought and in our behavior is due to this other thing which anthropologists called culture. Now they did not invent the word culture. The word culture was already in the vocabulary. It was usually applied at the time in the same way in, in some senses we have it now of someone who has culture. And so it was usually applied to those kinds of things like, you know, going to museums and artwork and so it was actually at first assumed to be a property of the cultured or the elite. And what anthropology said is, no, culture is something that everybody has. And in fact, it is the primary way in which we become human and in which we become particular human beings in relationship to each other. So, like I said, the concept of culture is actually pretty easy. It's perhaps more important to understand what it's talking against. So I'm gonna reduce, as Truyo does, I'm gonna reduce the culture concept to two parts. The first part is simply that when we look around the world, people have patterns in how they behave. Whereas Lavin and Schultz put it, related cultural beliefs and practices show up repeatedly in different areas of social life. So our belief about God, for example, will then translate into religion and also our, our holidays, 
And if you believe in a certain kind of God, then you're going to be celebrating this weekend that something big happened. And so this then organizes your temporal schedule. And we take a couple days off, usually a week in the good old days. And so the idea here is simply that we have patterns for our behavior. Pretty simple. But it's basically speaking against the idea. I mean, there are people who have proposed that human beings are just a bunch of uh, individuals walking around randomly doing things. And if you add it all up together, then that's what they do. And so what the culture concept says is that it is not just summing up our individual behaviors, but our behavior is structured by, excuse me, by those around us and by the people who live before us. And it's also structured by, and this is something that is kind of uh, perhaps more interesting, cool, and sophisticated. It's structured by our material culture, the kinds of stuff that we have and create in order to uh, express ourselves culturally, but also it shapes the way in which we move, behave, do things. And so uh, this is what uh, the uh, French sociologist, anthropologist, Pierre Bourdieu calls a habitus. And it's a, it's a kind of structured environment. We might consider it in some ways a form of niche construction in which people make things and then that shapes our behavior and our bodily form and things. As I'm looking at you now, I'm just thinking about people sitting in chairs. And that is actually, you wouldn't know it, but it is a learned bodily habit. And there are different societies, especially in the old days. Now we've made chairs all over the world. But, you know, there were societies in which you would squat and you would grow up squatting. It would be perfectly normal to sit through a two hour class just squatting and you'd feel fine. It'd be great. But we've learned something else. We learned to have, as the people from squatting society say about us, we have our legs hanging down. We learn to sit with our legs hanging down. And so our material culture sort of has a feedback loop with our habits and our patterns. I'm also thinking about, uh, for those of you who read uh, our babies ourselves and how the United States, we like to keep our babies in separate rooms to sleep in separate cribs and we don't wanna hold them too much. And you want them to be, well, why do we keep them? Why do we always have to keep them in? Why don't we like to, you know, hold them? And why do we have to keep them in separate rooms? What are we trying to teach them? What's our value on that? Independence. We want them to be independent. We also want to be independent of them. You know, you don't want them bothering you all the time. Right? We have this high value, we think, on the independence of our children. So we create these separate rooms. And then these giant strollers, you're walking down the street. It's like a, a rolling SUV, man. You got ton of space around the kid and a coke bottle right there for you to drink um you know our material culture our habitus is about reinforcing this idea of being you know a u.s person who takes up a lot of space and needs a lot of room all right so that's the first part there's actually only two parts culture concept part two Brittany, what's the most important part of the culture concept? Where do we get it from? Where do we get those patterns from? Yeah, our, in, our sort of environment. And so this is the second part of the concept, which is crucially important, is that we learn these patterns. <laughs> 
we absorb them from our environment, from our peers, what is called socialization or enculturation. We absorb it. We don't really, by the time we get to school, it's already almost all in us already. We already, it's not necessarily a formal learning thing. It happens as we're growing up. And so the reason this is so hugely important is, is that it means that our patterns that we learn are not going to be determined by our physical, our biology, and they're not going to be determined by if we're, you know, banana eaters or wheat growers or on snowmobiles. Now, that's not to say that our biology and our physical environment isn't hugely important. It is, and we don't want to lose sight of that. We never want, we talked about uh, human biological variation, and we don't want to lose sight of the things you can grow in different areas of the world, but it's not determining of our language, our beliefs, our actions in any place. So the crucial two parts of this are that we see patterns in human behavior, but we learn those patterns we don't get them from our race. And so the way things are structured, uh, yes, there it is, that socialization and enculturation. We don't, we don't recreate culture every time a, a new generation comes. We inherit a lot from our forebears, and then we elaborate on that, and we, we learn it with our peers. Now, Culture is also going to involve some degree of human consciousness. That is to say, it's not, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that we absorb without thinking about them, but there's a lot of things that we do bring to our attention and think about, especially in the sense of what uh, Lavin and Schultz and others call symbolic coding. Brooke, what is symbolic coding? Yeah, I mean, I think we will talk more. I mean, it's especially, it's especially apparent in terms of language, right? That in some ways, the words and the symbols we use are, well, I've just used the word symbol. They stand for something and we just all agree that this means we make these sounds and then we, we interpret these sounds in such a way. And so we can have various gestures that we start to agree upon that they mean a certain thing. And so I think someone in, in, uh, in the web post mentioned this gesture. I'm not doing, perhaps I don't, I don't, I am, remembering it from, from Ecuador and the Andes of, you know, when someone goes like this and you're trying to buy something, which means no I or there's not any of it. And, you know, I mean, it wouldn't mean anything if you don't know the gesture, but because you know that, and we agree that there's a symbol behind it. And in Levin and Schultz, they, they, they quote someone who says that humans seem almost overbuilt for symbolic thought. Like even when we seem to, we interpret the world, uh, well, that's why, you know, uh, you ever see that people say that, you know, the, the face of Jesus has appeared to them in a piece of toast or on a mountain or something. It might just be random dots, but we interpret things based on our symbolic understanding of the world. We see patterns even where there may not be patterns. And so this is something that is, uh, that is not, is, is present in some of our primate cousins, but is especially overbuilt in the world of human beings. And so it makes possible this idea of culture. And so for anthropologists, We tend to see the world in terms of uh, what Lavin and Schultz and others call holism. That people as individuals and as a society are interconnected and that things like religion and economics and politics are 
and this wonderful word knotted together. We also see, and this is an insight of the anthropologist Clifford Dirtz, that it's not that culture is an add-on to a natural human being. If we take away what we might consider the culture part, as Geertz put it, there wouldn't be any functioning human being there. We basically have added from very early on, we have co-evolved, might as well put that up. As we talked about, we've co-evolved with our tools, with our material culture, with our niche construction, in such that culture, our, our patterns, are the way that we become human. There's no such thing as a kind of a, a, a basic human who doesn't have culture. That would be uh, in some ways impossible. And so the way anthropologists have tried to see this is that we are biocultural creatures, that we are at one and the same time uh, doing our symbols and our patterns. Those also affect our biology as we've talked about. And we also transform our environment around us. That's where, again, we can talk about the habitus and our material culture and the kinds of, uh, the kinds of things that go into our, our bodily habits as well as our material life uh, as, a, as a society. The other important idea here, where we basically end this uh, this part of the chapter is how anthropology then developed this idea of cultural relativism, which is again a pretty basic idea. It kind of is is like the saying that you don't, you shouldn't judge someone until you've walked a few miles in their own shoe in their shoes, and it's the same way with cultural relativism is basically an attempt to make sense of what people are doing from their own point of view, from their own terms. And cultural relativism is what anthropology is trying to argue for in opposition to uh, what we call ethnocentrism, or the belief that whatever your patterns are, whatever you've learned to do, is the only way that you can be a human being is the divine or the natural way of doing, of being human. And so basically what we're saying is, we all become human in a particular way. We all learn certain patterns of becoming human. And so when we get judgy with each other, just be careful about that. Be careful because we've learned a particular way of being human you've learned a particular way of being human and other people have learned different ways. And that's not necessarily, uh, it isn't that one person has, the, has all the right answers. And so in its ideal sense, cultural relativism makes us aware of different possibilities of life, things that we could not have imagined or that we see people doing. And if we open ourselves up to those, it can, it can foster or invite a more tolerant position about the things that people are doing. I want to caution though, and we're going into the second part of that chapter, that that doesn't mean we just say anything goes and everything is okay. It's not philosophical relativism. It's a way of trying to understand what people are doing from their own point of view. But that doesn't necessarily mean we approve of all of those behaviors. Just because we understand why people have giant strollers walking down the street doesn't necessarily mean we think that is a great idea in human life, but we might understand where that impetus comes from. So we want to uh, contrast that with what we might call uh, moral relativism or the, the anything goes perspective. And so what this adds up to is basically a quote from an early anthropologist, someone who wrote uh, the book Patterns of Culture back in 1934, originally a poet and a writer, student of Franz Boas, um, who 
there's some debate about whether she actually said these words, but it sums up her kind of approach to uh, anthropology, which is that uh, it's not so much of you know trying to get the scientific stuff out of out of every bone and and uh, dental fragment, but to make the world safe for human differences. And she was writing at this at a time in the 1930s between the two wars, they didn't know that there was going to be another war yet. And she's basically writing it at a time when things were very unsafe for human differences and would become increasingly intolerant uh, at the time. And so what, what Benedict believes, and it goes back to, I hope what we've been learning from Trujillo and others is that the idea of culture is launched against these other ideas which would try to uh, homogenize, try to, how to say, undiversify the world's population, try to impose one system of values upon the rest of the world. And so it is hardly a fulfilled idea. It's hardly been done. This world is still not exactly safe for human differences, but it was seen as a kind of goal of some of these early anthropologists.